you can pass them around and and uh, afterwards when you get a chance. We got to the okay. My first slide. I don't know how to pronounce this. Is either the Ludites or the Luddites? Do anybody remember those? They were in about 1835, and they were violent protests against the start of the Industrial Revolution, really, of machines, because they were taking their jobs. The problem with them is they were about 200 years too soon, because it's going to start happening now, okay, as Steve mentions. So as he mentioned, there's 2 billion, do 2 billion plus people that are unemployed in the globe. You've got to look at global macroeconomics, not just the United States. And they're either subsistence farmers or they're really unemployed. And if you noticed that in the, in the 19th century, we had 90% of our people in agriculture growing food. Now we have 2%. Well, that's happening in China. That move from the agricultural as they get more, more productive into the cities. And it's not started in India yet. They're still very unproductive in India. But a little production, what if they move to 50% or 20%? So you can imagine all those people without jobs. Now we're going to talk about the solutions and, and, uh, and for that, which is monetary reform. The next slide, if I ever get them, is called Scarcity Over. And you need to read a book called Abundance by Diamantis and Kotlar. Okay, it's called Abundance. It's on, it's everywhere. And basically, the age of scarcity is over. There is, they can, we can make all the goods and services we want. It's over, okay. Uh, you see some shortages now. We just, we have all the solutions. We can't implement the solutions. And the, and the reason we can't is because of money. Now, the four areas where we're going to be losing jobs are artificial intelligence advances, robotics, nano manufacturing, and 3D printing. And I have about three minutes of total knowledge on this, so you can't ask any questions on the panel on all the technical, because that's not me, okay? <laughs> Think about artificial intelligence, and the, and the guy just came out at the Atlantic Monthly just a week ago. He was on Vareed's CNN show. Uh, and he came up with the same thing. And uh, after me, though, that was good. And uh, uh, you, you see the Google car, the example he gave, you see the Google car maybe eliminating taxi drivers. That's nothing. What about long haul trucking? I don't need them. I don't need truck drivers. OK? I mean, you just, I mean that's easy. Just put them on a highway and ship them down. You know, we don't need them. OK? So. Um, it's going to get worse, and they're going to take a lot of jobs. And, and the answer, yeah, yes, they also add a few jobs and repair. All the machines repair themselves, et cetera, but not enough to keep up with this unemployment. The third thing, and the most important thing that's happening right now, is a thing called Baxter. Okay? Baxter, there were 100 made last year. I don't know how many this year, but Baxter is a robot. The, the difference between this robot and others, it could work with humans next to them without hurting them. And they can be programmed by those same humans on the assembly line. And Baxter costs $22,000. Okay? Counting that $22,000, it's $4 an hour to operate. They don't go on vacation. They work 24 hours, seven days a week. Oh! Now I gotta catch up with myself. There we go. So you can you imagine, and this is just the start. What happens is this year they make a hundred, and there's Thompson's Law, I think it's called, and and they get better and cheaper as they mass produce them. Okay? And all of a sudden they replaced 400, you know, 200 this year, then 400, and then 800, and, and then there are other robots coming in. And I was in the National Degree of Gra Graphic magazine where I first saw it, was I saw a robot, a caretaker robot, 
taking care of an elderly monk in Thailand. I mean, that's, that's, that's a service that it's not even producing anything, okay? So robotics is really, really coming into its own, okay? And you're gonna see this, I think that most of us in this room don't have to worry too much about it, but you're gonna see, um, you're gonna see the unskilled workers probably get hit first and overseas where the, the, the Chinese rage has started at 71 cents an hour and is about two and a quarter. And as it starts approaching the $4 and they don't have to house them, they can start hiring um, Baxter. And if they waterproof Baxter, I think he can pick rice and do the planting for the rice. I mean, this thing is really amazing and, and it's just starting. I don't, the millennials might have a problem with it in a few years. It's not good, we'll, we won't probably, won't start seeing the effects of it probably for another five years uh, in the robotics field. The next field is uh, nano manufacturing where little machines start at the atom level and they make things. That's all I know, okay? <laughs> and the fourth thing is 3D printing, you all know that. Instead of having a distribution system, okay? Instead of having a distribution system that uh, you have to order, it gets trucked and things, the guy goes in the back room, goes to the cloud, gets the, gets the computer with the right formula. He has, the, he has to get the graphite or whether material they use and they print out the part. That's already here. And it's gonna get, of course, bigger. And that'll kill a couple jobs. Huh? I just saw a business down the street. Yeah, that's already here, okay? All right, I died. Well, this was good. How do I do the next one here? A Page up. That will work. It's not working. Huh? Worked before. I don't know, I probably turned it off knowing my technical ability. Go to the next one here. Well, it worked before. Yeah, it was working. I'm gonna go back a slide so they could see that, that author. Okay, so we got through that the jobs are, are basically going away. What are we gonna do? That's my next slide. I mean, what are we gonna do? We can't go to work. When we go to work 15 hours a week, like the guy said we would, what are we gonna do? I mean, you know, people are really tied to their jobs, a lot of people. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have more travel, more culture, entertainment, sports, research, education, exploration, environmental cleanups, and self-improvement, both physical, mental, and spiritual. So jobs are probably by sometime next century, will be minor, okay? They, the major technical thing of changing the slide, right? <laughs> I used to, when I first started, uh, you know, many years ago in my business, I just had the overhead projectors. I brought my slides and just, you know, I did it myself. So, so how do we solve that? How do we solve this problem of no jobs or jobs are dying? We already got billions not doing it. There it is. Yeah. Well, we're definitely gonna need people to fix the computers, right? Yeah. But they only, they only work. So what, what, should we, what, what, what should our gradual solution be? You know, I'm, I, don't, I don't wanna look to next century, but what, what should our, our solution be? And it's solved by monetary reform to pay for these things. We need to gradually reduce the work week. Uh, let's start with France. Let's go to 35, hour, 35 hours a week because we don't need the people to work full time because the machines are making it. Okay, go to the next slide then, would you? Gradually increase the guaranteed vacation time. I think France has six weeks. Some people have Europe. We have, what's our guaranteed vacation time in the United States? There is none. It's just a, some companies give two weeks. 
Okay? Well, we, since you don't need to work, we get more vacation time. Now here's where inequality comes in, or solving inequality. And how do I define inequality? You know, when we leave utopia, or what I call la-la land, okay, um, we're not at the human stage where we're, we can create a sort of perfect economy. We're, we're, we're probably a couple centuries away, okay? So what, how do I define inequality? What do I want to do? It says, well, I'm not really, as a lot of the rhetoric is, I'm not really worried about the top. I'm worried about the bottom, okay? And this is the inequality that I want to solve, and we can solve that even today. But I'm not worried, except for maybe two, three, four, five thousand families globally, which we need an estate tax to get their money back into, into recirculation. And by the way, redistribution for those political guys that everybody says, oh, we don't like redistribution. It's not redistribution, it's recirculation. Stop using that word because I get it back as a businessman instantaneously. They spend that money in my business. Okay. So the next one we have, we should have food stamps for all and larger amounts. So nobody has to worry about food, okay? We don't have to just give them a salary. We can just give them food stamps. It's money, it's just a credit card. It's not out of thin air. Free schooling from preschool to graduate school. Provide a stipend for residential assistance. Provide a stipend for, uh, a stipend for mu uh, miscellaneous purchases like transportation and clothing. And pay most of the health care costs, including dental and mental and nursing home care. Now, if you have all that, and you can do what you want to do, uh, are you unequal to the billionaire? Well, you'd have to still work. That's what the right says. Oh, nobody, well, everybody would get lazy and won't work. I said, you go to work for the extras, for the flat screen TV, for your extra vacation. So we need to, the word is decoupling, because you hear it in the medical uh, insurance thing. We need to decouple. Um, Employment. Okay, we need to decouple employment from basic living expenses. Okay. Decouple employment. Now, is that good for business? Oh, heck yes. No wage, no wage pressure, right? I don't have to over increase wages. No uh, uh, medical insurance, which is the largest thing in my practice in one of our businesses, our medical. It's the largest, other than payroll, is the largest expense we have by far, okay, because we're a service business, okay. Um, you wouldn't have to have welfare and social security disability and, and all that other stuff because this gives them their basic living. So they're covered, okay. And, all right, we'll go to the next one. Okay, now what I do what I do is, and then I'll open up for questions, and you can read my article, I'll give you the long version. What I do because of Bob, I try to invent new sayings to use in monetary reform every year, okay? Now this is my, this is the one I used uh, in prior years, right Bob? I'm gonna go back to the old ones and then I got a bunch of new ones, okay? There's no such thing as a national debt, we have not paid it off since 1835. A debt is something you have to pay back. It is the National Monetization Account. Okay. Now, it's interesting because I deal with a lot of politicians, both, in, um, both elected and um, running for office, and they all think the Treasury makes money. That's usually what happens. Or they say the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve makes money. And then our, my current representatives in my district that were running against each other, two liberals, running against each other, spending $11 million to run against each other a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not, they weren't sure the difference, even though I've been trying to train one of them for 15 years, I've failed. Okay, Between, what is monetary? They don't even know. Okay, next, next statement. There's no such thing, this I was last year, there was no such thing as business cycle for an entire economy. Business cycles are for businesses and industries. It should be called a monetary cycle. You see the cycle, it's driven by the monetary system, overinflating and underinflating. Okay. 
So when you see, say, oh, it's just the business cycle. It's not a business cycle. A business cycle is like uh, the buggy whip. The buggy whip had it during the, then the cars were invented and the went out of existence. Okay, next. I got a bunch of sayings here, but I'm going to go over inflation. Pop the next one. Oh, taxes. This is what I use also. Taxes and spending, fiscal policy. You notice how the banks get it to switch the debate in Congress as soon as it crashed. The debate went as how much we tax and spend and regulate. It had nothing to do with the cause of the Great Recession. Therefore, it can't have anything to do with the solution. We have monetary reform next. Now, what I do, and I've got a couple more sayings coming up here, okay? But what I do is I developed, I don't forgot, I mean, I keep adding points to this because the main argument is inflation, okay? And I approach all my arguments on, um, on an economic basis. I do not use social justice, fairness, morality. I might, you might want to use it later, but you use economic justification because that's what the right looks at, okay? So I want to do economics and macroeconomics first, okay? So this is how overcoming inflation objective. First of all, we divert, with monetary reform, we can diversify the monetary delivery systems. We also want to encourage production and productivity because that's how we get more goods and services out there, the more productive you are. But it's the opposite, and productivity doesn't include labor. They equate labor and employee is a microeconomic term, but customer, client, consumer, and citizen is a macroeconomic term. You see the opposite? So they're trying to cut wages, and we're trying to increase wages so we have better spending, so or more sales. You know, I'm a business person, not an economist. So you want to always encourage productivity. Reduction of high interest rate charges, Encouraging savings and investing rather than consumption. If they, people are worried about, you always try to get them to save for retirement. Encourage spending on services rather than goods. Ser goods or services are easy. Those are u human or robots. Doesn't cost a lot to the system. Having the Commerce Department create and publish numerous inflation formulas and statistics. Checks and balances on our monetary creation. We have to have a lot, always have a lot of checks and balances. You can go to the next one. So I give them 14 points why we, we can have no inflation, because they're looking at that inflation. That's all they all say is inflation. I call it excess inflation. Vo voters will be able to cast their votes based on the inflationary management of the country. Inflation is the most important statistic. GDP, I have an article if you want to read it. It's, it, it's on my blog on my website. GDP is not a very good indicator of the economy. Okay, and everybody calls growth and GDP and and, and really it, it doesn't it, it doesn't really mean much. Okay, it means that you're going up instead of down. That's about it. So currency and commodity markets should be monitored in the long term, including gold. In other words, this is how you control inflation. Okay. Increasing taxation removes money from circulation. You can increase taxes. Okay. Although the big thing about monetary reform for the right is it reduces taxes. I can create the money instead of, so that's a big argument for the right. Big. Okay. Competition keeps pressure on prices. We want to encourage competition. Substantially encourage, this is for your environmentalists. It, 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 it's, it, environmentalism is it works with capitalism, okay? It's not, it's not incompatible. Substantially encourage reusing renewables, repairing, and recycling to reduce demand pressures on raw materials, although commodities are down right now. Elimination of fractional reserve banking, that calls inflation. Even uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, who won that, did that whole study on the 19th century banking versus the 20th, found that the 20th century banking was far more inflationary than the 19th century banking. Okay. Now this, I added, I, I thought about this. I says, what happens if we want to put out, or a country wants to put out more money than printing and you want to control inflation? Even though we got rid of treasuries, they could sell some treasuries. When they sell treasuries, it brings money out of the system and back into the treasury. 
and, and that could be a safety valve, okay? I just thought of that one. That was a new one. So now I got 14, okay? So I always tell them, well, I got 14 points to controls inflation, okay? Next, on the, now I'll go back to my saying. And it's not who is running the monetary system, but what is the system? And a lot of people, a lot of books are written on who's running it. It has nothing to do with who's running it or regulating it. It's the system, okay? Next. All right, this, I couldn't answer why. You know, we come here and say, well, why is this, why is it? I was a, teaching a college course in this thing and, a, and a, or a, a business class. I says, well, why, they always ask why, okay? And I kind of figured it out, one answer. In academic, academia, Nick might disagree with me, but I've checked that out with a few. Academia is dominated by the neoclassical microeconomic philosophy their theories and formulas has money as a minor factor. In reality, it is the major factor, okay? And so money, they have been changed based on the old industrial system, I guess, from the 19th century, but I try not to attack academia. I'll let the academics attack each other. Okay, next. When money flows, we grow, and when money stops, we flop. That's... <laughs> I kind of made that up because it's true. If, if you notice during inflationary cycles, people are kind of happy. You know, they have money to spend. We're having a good time. And then when you take it away, we go. And uh, Professor Chang from um, Oxford, I think, when he wrote Bad Samaritans, is that he proved that you know, growth was quite, you know, if you use GDP as a measure, was quite good during, uh, in the Latin America and other countries when we had a higher inflationary. Uh, I'm not sure if it's my last one, but I got a couple others. Okay, it's my last one. Oh, okay, good. I got another comment that I just thought. Here's another one for you, Mark. And I didn't make this up. It was written by an assistant treasury secretary named uh, uh, Roberts, who wrote a book called The End of Laissez-Faire Capitalism. And he was a, he was a Reagan appointee, so. Um, outsourcing jobs is not trade. That's a great sentence. Outsourcing jobs is not trade. But jobs are declining because if you, if, if the Mexican worker south of the border as they walk across the border makes $5 an hour, he's taking a $20 an hour job in El Paso. And so if you get rid of the Mexican, you move it back to El Paso, what happens to that poor Mexican? Okay, what does he do? Okay, and so we're all in this world together, and the, the monetary system is unsustainable. It will fail. This has to fail because it doesn't work. And, and one of the reasons it doesn't work is because everybody thinks, the business people, because I live among the business people, uh, think on a microeconomic basis instead of a macroeconomic basis. And they have labor and employees, not as customer clients and consumers and citizens. So when I see those pictures of, the, so of those people in the bread line, I said, well, boy, those are lousy customers. I got to make them better customers because I want to make more money, okay? And when I see that, that, that apartment that's empty to kicked out, I says, oh, there's another lousy customer, you know? And I want a lot of good customers. And you see how the economic defense all of a sudden brings in the other side, then you can bring in the social justice and the fairness and the moral situation, okay? And how's my time doing? Because we go to the panel. Okay, okay. We can go to the panel. I can take questions and stuff. So I defend monetary reform on an economic basis only, okay? And uh, I tried to make headwinds. Now we're going to talk a little bit about politics. Um, I've made headway with one congressman. Okay, let's just start. What what our goal is? Uh, what our goal should be in Congress? And although maybe some other countries like Greece would will implement this first, is is. Our goal should be to start the debate. The debate has not started. Among us it has, okay, but it hasn't, hasn't started. So it should be a very general debate. Our goal should be what? 
to start the debate. They're not debating it. Even after the crash of 08, which was totally monetary, it had nothing to do with, the, and Japan's crash was totally monetary in, 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 in 1990, uh, it, it, they don't debate it. They switch it to tax and spend, which has nothing to do with it. Okay? So um, that's been my goal. Um, most people that I talk to thinks the Treasury creates our money. That's the first step. Okay? Uh, I'm starting to reach out to Republicans now. I know most people in this room would. Um, it's hard to, I always stated, it's hard to change somebody's mind who's wrong than to change somebody's mind who's confused. So I started with the Democrats first. <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> We're, I, we're succeeding a little bit, okay? They, they, they're kind of figuring it out, okay? Um, when, when I ran for Congress in 1996, and I did all my talks in our district, nobody knew what I was talking about. I mean, nobody, okay? And then recent talks now, after the crash, they kind of, oh yeah, uh-huh, and yeah, we understand, you know, so a lot of people are getting the gist, and I don't get as many as glazed over looks. You know, when they start talking about money, you get as glazed over look. Well, my whole career has been in money, okay? Didn't start out to be that way, but that's, fortunately for me, I got lucky and ended up in the right industry where all the money is. <laughs> so, so it's pretty good. Okay, any questions? Yes. He left, he left Merrill Lynch? Uh -huh. And uh, they went to pension funds and unions and um, several other sources. And uh, I said, uh, Jerry, uh, you're making big money, but uh, you're going to run out of customers. Mm -hmm. Because when, uh, this means that there won't be any more. When the big transition for our industry went overseas, mm -hmm. that's where people were unemployed. Yeah. And they are not good customers when they're not earning a living. Right. And that's, they play a role in the economy. It's but an if, important component. Yeah. They, they are two faced. They are workers. This is where the this is. Yeah. Consumers who need to consume. This is where the government has to step in a little bit. Yeah. Well, what 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 we need? See, um, what we need is a lot of programs up there, freebies. Yeah. It's not good for China either. You notice China's deficit spending or, or massive domestic spending and because their employees don't earn anything. Yeah, the middle class works, the capitalism is bringing it up, but they still have to do trillions of dollars of spending to keep their domestic spending up because their workers don't make any money and they're basically almost slaves living in those dormitories, including the ones that make your iPad. They can't buy the mini iPad, okay, all right? The, the products they're making. And this is obvious from 1907 with Ford. Do you have a question though? Okay. Well, the solution, the solution is, the solution is, is we want to bring the rest of the world up to us in Europe and Japan, not us coming down to them. So we have to. And the question is, I, I, the question, the answer is tariffs. Okay. I like to call it wage tariffs, but it's also environmental, just to add a little flavor to it. And it's very interesting to me on this free trade nonsense. And Ricardo was bong, by the way, Nick. Uh, this free trade, the, uh, the United States in the 19th century, Great Britain before, uh, China and Japan, the four largest industrial powerhouses, I guess you get Germany now, but they, uh, they all built their industries with high tariffs. All of them. And China still has high tariffs. Ours are literally non-existent. So we're in a trade war and we're not fighting. We're not even losing, we're not fighting. Okay, and, but again, with limited jobs, I mean, we, we haven't even, the, the, the companies that are moving to these, they're, the Chinese, those companies that went to China are now moving to Cambodia and Laos. I did just let, let you know. Even Vietnam is starting to get too much pressure for them. And eventually in another decade or two, they're gonna run out of countries. They got Africa yet, you know, we got, uh, okay. And Indonesia is still pretty poor. But again, the robot's gonna replace those people. 
And the first robots are going to replace the unskilled workers first. Yeah, they, they yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. They, they don't buy any of the products they make, you know. They just, they just consume energy, you know, and a little bit of middles. So it's an interesting world, but what's interesting is that when you talk, especially the candidates to want to win in a red district, okay, they would rather lose than take on monetary reform. It always surprises me. They would rather lose. Okay, Democrats that I've counseled and told them how to do it, okay, because people are looking for the solution and the right monetary reform and some other things and labeling himself the economic Democrat, you can go after the Republicans. They would rather lose because it's so alien to them. They're usually, I won't say anything about our last few presidents that were constitutional lawyers, but uh, it just loses something. They just can't grasp it or something, and, and they lose because they're in a red district. And in a red district, which is a business district, you want to talk economics. You definitely don't want to talk social justice because they don't care, okay? So you, talk, you put it in, in, in economic terms. Yes? Yes. Sometimes people don't understand your meaning. Yeah. Communication. You lost them. Yeah. What you said, even though you didn't mean what they think. And it's not my best feature is my communication skills, so I know. <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, well, it's just to bring up a, a, a word that gets bandied around so much and has very little clear meaning uh, that I, I can what, what think word? of as the word capitalism. Yeah. Okay, that's a good question, and, and I do it. Capitalism, and basically, and I'm going to start defending capitalism right now, because uh, you're all socialists. Okay, <laughs> capitalism. Cap, capitalism is that if it, the cap, definition of capitalism is we li deliver our goods and services through a non-governmental organization. To the people. In other words, the government doesn't deliver, the, doesn't produce, nor deliver the goods and services. We have private, private firms to do it. You can have nonprofits. You can have co-ops. It's just non-government. The government can't do everything because it just gets overlooked. We're all humans, run by humans, and boy, do we screw up a lot. So, you want to diversify it, and this is why I only worry about maybe the top two tenths of people in the in the world of over of having too much money because you you want those and, and you get a state tax huh you mean two tenths or two tenths of one percent two tenths of one percent thanks nick and you, you i'm worried about the two tenths where the state tax laws take an effect